So uh, welcome, and uh, let's be reminded what we're doing. Uh, this is the Thursday morning Bible study. We have been looking at the subject of prayer. We are not looking at it from a theoretical point of view. We are hopefully looking at it from a very practical and personal point of view because we all know that God has given us a great privilege in coming before his throne of grace to receive mercy and to find help. He has declared to us that he hears and answers prayer. How he does that is beyond my understanding, but I believe that he does, and I hope that you do too. And I'm convinced that we all probably feel like we could pray better <laughs> or be more focused in our prayers. It's not that I don't want to pray. It's sometimes I don't know what to say or how to pray. And looking at some of the prayers of the scripture, I think we get kind of stimulated to, to think, oh, well, this, this is appropriate prayer. This, this is prayer that can, I, can, uh, I can imitate. Jesus gave us the Lord's Prayer, of course, uh, as kind of a model, and we're going to look at that. We're going to get to that eventually. But uh, I, I thought we would take a couple of these assorted prayers around and, and just kind of listen to them. And maybe in the listening to them, uh, we would learn a lot. And uh, the prayer that I want to look at this morning is in 1 Chronicles chapter 29. The context is that if you'll remember, God selected David uh, to be the king of Israel. And it was David's great privilege to be the one who kind of gathered the resources for the building of the temple. And this was a big deal. David would not build it. Solomon, his son, would be the one who would be involved in the building. But it would be David who would see that those resources were gathered so that they had everything they needed for the building of the temple. And if you go back into 1 Chronicles chapter 29, you, you read about that, and it talks about the people giving uh, to the building of the temple. Listen to what it says. Then the leaders of fathers' houses made their freewill offerings, as did also the leaders of the tribes, the commanders of thousands and of hundreds, and the officers over the king's work. They gave for the service of the house of God 5,000 talents and 10,000 derricks of gold and 10,000 talents of silver and 18,000 talents of bronze and 100,000 talents of iron. Now, I haven't calculated how much that is, but I think the impression is it was a bunch. And it was probably enough. <laughs> but all of these resources were given so that the temple of God could be built. Whoever had precious stones gave them to the treasury of the house of the Lord. And the people rejoiced because they had given willingly. For with a whole heart they had offered freely to the Lord. And David the king also rejoiced greatly. There's nothing like uh, joyful and cheerful giving. And I think I've known some of that, and I've known some of the other of that. I've known times when I have given reluctantly, and you probably have too. And you know what it says in 2 Corinthians, that God loves a reluctant giver. I mean, God loves a, <laughs> God loves a cheerful giver, right? And here we have this picture of, of the leaders of Israel. And if the leaders are giving, you can just imagine that the rest of the people are falling in line. And they're bringing these gifts uh, of, of silver and gold and iron and jewels. And they're placing them uh, before the king in order that the temple might be built to the glory of God and the worship of God go forward. And it's just a, it's a, it's a, it's a wonderful day. 
and people are excited. And it's at that point that David prays. And I want us to look at his prayer this morning. So let's pray together. Father, thank you for this special passage of scripture, this special time in the life of your people, when your people have gathered joyfully to give generously to the building of your temple, not because they wanted to see a building built, but because they wanted your glory to be known. And so, Father, we pray that we would appreciate uh, how David prays, and it might encourage us in our own prayer life to pray more fervently and joyfully. And we look to you now in Jesus' name. Amen. So, it is at this point that David prays. And I would break the prayer down, as your notes indicate, into first David's prayer regarding God because he, he spends the first half of his prayer just exalting the character of God and then David's prayer for the people who have given to the building of the temple and that of course is very instructive to us as we think about how to pray for others so we have these two sections of the prayer uh, let me grab some materials here uh, you will need these. The opening half of the prayer is David's exaltation of who God is. I guess I would say on the front end of that, when you think of your own prayer life, how much of your time is spent in the worship of the character of God and the reflection on the nature of God and uh, just meditation on the faithfulness of God, uh, just kind of basking in the glory of who God is. I would admit mine's minimal, but not David's. Listen to how David prays. Therefore David blessed the Lord in the presence of all the assembly. And David said, Blessed are you, O Lord, the God of Israel our Father forever and ever. Yours, O Lord, is the greatness and the power and the glory and the victory and the majesty. For all that is in the heavens and in the earth is yours. Yours is the kingdom, O Lord, and you are exalted as head above all. Both riches and honor come from you, and you rule over all. In your hand are power and might, and in your hand it is to make great and to give strength to all. And now we thank you, our God, and praise your glorious name. So before he talks about anything related to the collection of the money or the use of the money or the building of the temple or the outreach of the people of God, he, he, just, he just reflects about the God who's going to be worshipped in this temple, a God who, is, who has been there in ages past and is their hope for years to come. And he says, this is verse 11, blessed are, verse 10, blessed are you, O Lord, the God of Israel, our Father, forever and ever. In that opening statement, he highlights the uh, eternal nature of God. God is forever and ever. He is the covenant making and covenant keeping God of Israel, the God who comes to Abraham and says, I'm going to be a God to you and to your children after you for the generations to come, and I'm going to make you great, and I'm going to touch the nations through you, and I'm going to keep my promises. I'm going to remember my covenant with you. David says, here we are at this particular point in history, some thousand years later perhaps, saying, blessed are you, O Lord, the God of Israel, our Father, forever and ever. Then he says in verse 11, yours, O Lord, is the greatness, power, glory, victory, and the majesty. He's just piling up 
ways of saying that God is the greatest of all time. That's what the, those letters, G-O-A-T, the greatest of all time. You are great and no one is greater and your greatness we cannot imagine. You are powerful and in fact you are omnipotent and you are glorious and we can only pretend or hope to understand how glorious God is and it, yours is the victory you you are you will fulfill your purposes you will uh, defeat evil and yours is the majesty you deserve all honor and submission and authority you know, I don't know that he's trying to give an exhaustive description of who God is. He's just kind of he's just kind of reflecting on on the greatness and the glory and the majesty of his God. And that would be a great way to start prayer. It, Jesus said to start this way, our Father which art in heaven. That kind of says the same thing without all the flowery words. But here David gives these several words that are words that we could use when we bow in prayer to just to, to think for a moment of the greatness and the power and the glory and the majesty and the victory. Then he adds to it. He says, for all that is in the heavens and the earth is yours. I mean, you can imagine there's this big, 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 big pot of money and jewels and whatever metals that the people have given them. But David prays, all, all that's in the heavens and the earth is yours. Even this, this massive amount of money given to the building of the temple, it's yours. And you... you we can look there and there and wherever we look, it's yours. You know, we, we have this way of thinking that things are ours. You know, I'm the owner. Well, <laughs> is that really the way it is? Or are we not just stewards of, of the resources God entrusts to us? That's why we are to be faithful in our stewardship. Yours is the kingdom, he says, O Lord, and you are exalted as head above all. You are ruling. You are the head above all things. Your kingdom, we, we can't see it, we can't define it, uh, we can't map it out, but, but your reign is over all things, and you're the head, you're in charge. We see the circumstances of life a lot of times and we think, boy, things are going out of control. They're in chaos, right? Well, not ultimately. God is in control. The Hebrews says Jesus sustains all things by his powerful word. We don't always understand or see it, but again, the scripture says he's exalted his head above all. Verse 12. Both riches and honor come from you, and you rule over all. All this money that we've given, where did, where did it come from? From our pockets? From under our mattresses? From our accounts? No. All these riches come from you, and you rule over it. In your hand are power and might. And in your hand it is to make great and to give strength to all. He pictures God with a hand. In your hand are power and might. All he has to do is extend his hand and exercise his power. And in your hand it is to make great. God can make you great. God can give you strength. God can work in your life. He's the source of all blessing. And now we thank you, our God, and praise your glorious name. So as, I, as I think about who you are, I can do nothing more than 
thank you for, for your generosity to us, your presence with us, your commitment to us, your devotion to us, your faithfulness to us, and praise your glorious name. When you talk about the name of God, you're typically talking about the character of God. And praise your wonderful character. David has, has just opened in prayer and uh, <laughs> taken time to reflect on who God is. There's an interesting story. I, you may have heard it uh, it deals with kind of my background. Uh, the Westminster Confession of Faith and Catechisms, I, you may have never heard of those documents, but they were significant documents back in, in the 1640s uh, when they were declaring uh, biblical truth uh, after the Protestant Reformation. And they came to answering the question, what is God, who is God? They just didn't know how to answer that. I mean, how can you define God in a few words? And a, a one particular man was, was asked if, they would, if he would just pray that they would be able to come up with a good uh, answer to that question. And he prayed, God is a spirit, infinite, eternal, and unchangeable in his being, wisdom, power, holiness, justice, goodness, and truth. Everybody paused and said, we have our answer. That becomes the answer to that catechism question, what is God? God is a spirit. Infinite, no limits, eternal, timeless, unchangeable, consistent in who he is, his being, what he knows is wisdom, what he can do, his power, his eternal essence, his holiness, his justice, his goodness, his truth. That's kind of like what David has done here. He, he just, he highlights the character of God. And my point would be in, in our praying uh, to spend more time reflecting on who God is and less time on what my needs are. The second half of the prayer, uh, David, he doesn't stop there. Uh, he, in verse 14, he goes on, but who am I and what is my people that we should be able thus to offer willingly? For all things come from you and of your own have we given you. We are strangers before you and sojourners as all our fathers were. Our days on the earth are like a shadow. There is no abiding. O oh Lord, our God, all this abundance that we have provided for building you a house for your holy name comes from your hand and is all your own. I know, my God, that you test the heart and have pleasure in uprightness. In the uprightness of my heart, I have freely offered all these things. And now I have seen your people who are present here offering freely and joyously to you. O Lord, the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Israel, our fathers, keep forever such purposes and thoughts in the hearts of your people and direct their hearts toward you. Grant to Solomon, my son, a whole heart, that he may keep your commandments, your testimonies, and your statutes, performing all, and that he may build the palace for which I have made provision. So, oh. He turns after reflecting on the character of God to reflect upon himself and the others who are there. Who am I and what is my people? You know, when you, if you've ever been out on a hillside on a blanket, maybe looking up at the stars of the sky and, and you're reflecting on the greatness of God and the awesome character of God, if you've ever been in a situation like that, your typical reaction is to think what of yourself. You kind of, kind of feel tiny compared to the stars of the sky and the galaxies and all that God has created, and you feel so small. And, and David 
has that feeling in verse 14. Who am I? Who am I? And what is my people that we should be able to offer willingly? They can take no credit for their generosity, for all things come from you, and of your own have we given. He says, yes, we've given, but we've merely been the, the means by which your resources have come to build your temple. Verse 15, for we are strangers before you and sojourners as all our fathers were. Our days on the earth are like a shadow and there is no abiding. He had spoken of God being eternal forever and ever but when he turns to man he talks about us as a mist a shadow that's there one minute and gone the next we are strangers on the earth pilgrims aliens our days on earth are brief we don't tend to think of our lives like that do we, we especially those of us that have been blessed with years uh, we've been around a while. We've been around the block. Having lunch with Walter Rothschild yesterday, 94 years old. Been around the block and still going strong. That's wonderful. But in light of God's eternal nature, we, we are but a shadow. Last Tuesday, I did a funeral for a 43-year-old father in Colorado died suddenly, leaving four children. Here one day, gone the next. We don't know, do we? But our God is eternal and we are temporary. Verse 16, O Lord our God, all this abundance that we have provided for building at you a house for your holy name comes from your hand and is all your own. When we give to God, we are not giving our gifts to God. We are giving his resources to God as a steward of that which has been entrusted to us. And then he says in verse 17, I know, my God, that you test the heart and have pleasure in uprightness. In the uprightness of my heart, I have freely offered all these things. And now I have seen your people who are present here offering freely and joyously to you. What's God most interested in when we give to him? Our hearts. Not the amount. Not this gift more than that gift. But the heart, the, the, the devotion, the the desire to honor God and to uh, extend God's kingdom. It's, David is saying, I know God, all these people have given all these gifts, but you're not looking at the pile of gifts, you're looking at the hearts. And David says, as far as I can tell, I've given with, with a clean heart and a devoted heart, and these people have done the same. I love it in 2 Corinthians 8. There's that passage where it talks about the giving of the Macedonian churches who begged for the privilege of giving even out of their own poverty and even out of their own suffering. That's the kind of giving God loves. People who, who give graciously and generously from a heart that desires to give. Verse 18, O Lord, the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Israel, our fathers, keep forever such purposes and thoughts in the hearts of your people and direct their hearts to you. This is really the, where I think the first place that he really makes a petition. You know, we think of prayer as, as requesting things from God. What, what are you praying for? What is your petition? Well, it's not until 18 that you actually see the petition it is that God, the eternal God, the covenant-keeping God, would keep forever such purposes and thoughts, the attitudes in our hearts, and direct their hearts toward
toward you. Do you ever wonder what to pray for your children and grandchildren? Pray that God would keep forever his purposes in their hearts and that he would direct their hearts toward him. You may not know specifically what their circumstances are or what they're dealing with or what they're struggling with, but you can pray that they would, God would direct their hearts toward him. And then he offers this additional prayer for Solomon. Grant to Solomon, my son, a whole heart that he may keep your commandments, your testimonies, and your statutes, performing all, and that he may build the palace for which I have made provision. So again, he talks about the heart. He says it's really a heart issue, and we want to pray for heart issue and for heart devotion and heart cleansing but notice he doesn't disconnect the heart from the life he says a whole heart is reflected in an obedient life that he may keep your commandments your testimonies your statutes the one who has a heart that seeks after God is someone who wants to live a life of obedience to God and that he may build the palace for which I have made provision, that he may fulfill the purpose for which he has been assigned. And, and we all have assignments. Uh, we have jobs to do. It may not be to build a temple, uh, but it will be to uh, love a neighbor, and it might be to uh, encourage the lonely or, you know, there are all kinds of things to do. And so we're asking God to grant us a heart to be obedient to his commands and to fulfill the purposes for which God has left us here. You might think, well, what, what's, what's God left me here to do? What, what's my purpose here at the village? Well, we may have different purposes, but we all have the opportunity to impact the lives of others in our community and to bring honor and glory to him. So here, here's this prayer. I, I just think it's a, a significant uh, expression, uh, first of the glory of God, and, and the greater and the bigger we think of God, and the more accurately we, we, we meditate upon who God is, uh, the more our heart will beat with joy and devotion and um, submission and worship. And then to pray for a right attitude about ourselves as aliens and strangers in the world, as stewards of God's resources and, and those who who ought to pray for an upright heart and a heart that freely gives and joyously gives. Now that may create some confession because you may get convicted that uh, you're not always like that. And if you're not, that's fine. Uh, confess that you are and ask for God's cleansing grace. And then to pray that God would direct your heart to him and the hearts of those you love to him, and that others may have a heart after God, keeping his statutes and fulfilling the purposes for which God has, has called them. Well, next week we'll look at another of the great prayers of Scripture, but that's a good one for today. Let's pray. Father, we thank you for the privilege of looking at your word and just to reflect upon David's prayer here is an encouragement to us. Hear him exalting your name and uh, Father, I pray for a greater and greater vision of your glory and your majesty and your power and your victory and your splendor. Pray, Lord, that whenever we pause to pray, we would reflect for a few moments on your character, your eternal nature. 
sovereign grace commitment to us and faithfulness to us your holiness then let us pray in light of that let us see ourselves as as your children by grace and your stewards of resources and pilgrims in this world uh, father continue to make us your children uh, give us a heart direct our hearts toward you and enable us to fulfill the purposes for which we are here and you to bless us in our prayers we pray in jesus name